It's a great joy to be introducing Arjun Singh, partner of Arthur D. Little for FinTech and the host of Couchonomics. We had such a great time yesterday preparing this panel and uh, I look forward to uh, a great discussion here on building the case for sustainable climate finance. And uh, Sardar Durrani, partner of the Orisis Group. Osiris. I keep getting that wrong. I don't know why. <laughs> he is uh, an impact investor of a VC private equity. We met in Hong Kong a few weeks ago. And Giovanni Everdren from the strategy, Chief Strategy Officer of the CBI. So we're going to have a <clears throat> wide-ranging discussion here, and I hope you all join in. Take it away, Arjun. All right. Thanks. So, uh, well, thanks for hanging around. I guess it's fairly late in the evening. Uh, we'll try and make this as lively as possible. Um, we can spend talking about what we did last night. That might be more interesting than climate financing. But I guess I've been told I can't do that. So uh, I guess, uh, you know, Martin set the scene uh, uh, quite clearly. You know, we, we, we've, we've heard some, some very good announcements uh, this, these last few days in terms of pledges and grants and funds which are coming into the market. But I think the, the gap in climate financing is sort of woefully large, right? Uh, and, and that sort of begs the question in my mind, and I'll, you know, I'm a simple human being, so I'll break it down into sort of four or five key parts the way I see this going. One is we need more funding and financing, and I think it should not come out of the state actors, but increasingly should come out of the retail market. Uh, and for a simple reason, I'll, 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 I'll throw a statistic out there, which is, you know, if we need about six to eight billion dollar, uh, trillion dollars of, of climate financing annually by the year 2030, the, U, the entire U.S. economy spend is 4.2 trillion. Oh, sorry, the other way around. So four trillion to six trillion. So you can't actually rely on public sector money to come in entirely. So the private sectors need to. Secondly, uh, just echoing the point which Ajay Banga made at the Singapore FinTech Festival as a part of his closing note, was that we need to get smarter in terms of how we are deploying capital today, that we're not creating problems for tomorrow. So it's one thing to build a dam, spend $50 million today, and then 10 years later realize that we now need to spend $200 billion to, to get rid of the, the issue we have. The money that we have needs to be deployed. Uh, it needs to be deployed sensibly uh, so that you know the money is actually going into genuine green projects uh, and not either the greenwashing ones, which you and I were talking about, or actually landing up in brown projects. We do need an element of traceability because that, I think, is required for the confidence for more money to come in. And lastly, but not least, but lastly, and equally important is that we should be able to quantify the impact, right? So with that sort of scene set, right, Jill, let me start with you, right? One of the big thing in terms of getting the retail side going is this sort of holistic buy-in, right? And, and that's multiple stakeholders, right? So give us your perspective coming in from a bank perspective, also someone who's operating in the Web3 space. How do you actually galvanize, how do you create that buy-in? Well, if I knew, <laughs> I'll let you know. I think, I mean, all jokes aside, honestly speaking, it's, it's very complicated. And I say that because, you know, I saw Martin and I saw all the things you're talking about, right? And in my head, I'm just thinking, I can barely get this on the agenda for people to genuinely understand that there's a problem and to buy in that there actually is a need rather than something that we have to do because the regulator is mandating it, which is, I think, if I speak to a lot of my colleagues in banking off the record, not in forums like this, is probably what they will tell you and what they definitely tell me, which is, it's really, really hard. We have a massive constituency of different people that have an influence over what the bank does, from shareholders to board members, to our regulator, to our customers. I can tell you from my experience, I wish it were different, but this is not a topic that's front and center for most people. It's something where I have to convince them. And it's not that different in my mind from, and depending on how mature you are, probably five, 10 years ago, when we started talking about customer experience. Right? That was the new thing and everyone needed to do it or tell the management if you were in HR. And it was one of those things where it took a lot of time for that to get adopted and get the data right and figure out what kind of data do we have and how do we use it and how does it trace it and what's the impact. And I see a lot of that repeating. And so for us right now, I think I have to convince people to do it. And so in a way, I'm kind of happy that my, my, my expectation is that because of COP28 and everything that's been happening that the central bank, I know that they will, is gonna announce a whole suite of regulations for banks. 
right? Up until now, it was sort of open. They kind of forced bigger banks to do it. A mid-sized or smaller bank like ours, we didn't really have to other than, you know, talk about how much paper we save or light bulbs and that kind of stuff. So nothing really more meaningful. And I think that's gonna change. I know it's gonna change because of, as of January, I'm the proud owner of an ESG function that I have to stop. So if anyone has any good people that wanna work in a bank on this kind of stuff, I'm, I'm very open. But I guess that's a very long way of saying is that despite some of the PR and everything you see in now today in COP, I find it still very hard to have the basic simple conversations around climate change and that is needed. There's still a lot of people that I talk to and these are very intelligent people who do not actually believe that climate change is a thing, let alone something that they have to invest time and effort and money in, even more so to do that away from the traditional way of making money. Right? And then on top of that, I think as a bank, we're still struggling with a lot of the data. Uh, QMB, which is one of the largest banks in the, in the region, is one of our main shareholders. I'm flying there tomorrow. And if I look at what they're doing already, you know, I'm just getting really, really worried because if you want to do this right, it is really, really not easy. And actually costs a lot of money in order to get it right. And when you get it right, there's not necessarily, back to your point, Martin, there's not necessarily a lot of ROE immediately either, right? It's not necessarily sexy work, but it's work that needs to be done. And so that's kind of what I look at. It. Can I bring you in? You're in impact financing. What's your view? I had a, I had a whole bunch of host of points to make to those as well, but um, I'll keep it easy. Um, as an equity pair, we generally, like you mentioned, uh, we don't jump in unless there's a ROI. Simple as that, right? So, but there's the world has changed. Um, What's unfortunate in platforms uh, such as a globalized ESG learning push is that people are still behind the curve, you're right, but it's not just the, the, the common man who's behind the curve, it's um, power brokers are behind the curve because there's something called uh, Impact 1.0, Impact 2.0, Impact 3.0. Just to give you a brief definition, what Bill and Melinda Gates were doing in Africa was Impact 1.0. They give you a, a hundred bucks and say, hey, make a school, keep it sustainable, I don't want my money back, it's a grant, it's a charity, just keep it sustainable and that school grows into two, four, five, six, seven schools. Well done, fantastic, that's impact one point. Then the World Banks and ADBs of the world stepped in and they said, you know what, a lot of that, what Martin was saying was impact 2.0 as well, that you build out, we will go as World Banks, ADBs of the world, we will de-risk this space for the private sector to step in. But before that, no one else can touch it because it's too risky, no one else can kind of gauge what is right, what is wrong. And they go in with an army of consultants and they build it out and 60% is clawed back into consultancy fees back to Europe. And guess what? 40, 30% is actually allocated on the ground at the, at the focal area where impact is required the most. So that was also a failure for us. So that's why private step, uh, sector stepped in and we say, hey, impact 3.0 is when lean teams go in. We get the same PPAs, we get the same dollarized returns, but we do it faster, younger, quicker and uh, we'll deploy it for a better return mechanism as well because now your cost base is not that high. The only difference in this case is that people have to recognize that we're doing it in, in what we call structural deficits in these markets. So uh, one, one step back, our core focal area is frontier markets. So we do Bangladesh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Nepal, now Middle East as well because it's not frontier, but it's emerging, but there's low hanging structural deficits that need to be fixed and there's return in those. So, what happens in these structural def uh, deficit spaces, usually there are only four or five. There's food security, there's climate security. So all of this will fall, fall under ESG, but there's climate security in there. There's tech security, which includes your access to education, access to healthcare, access to online banking, all of that. Um, sorry, not he healthcare, that's a separate one line. And then there's something basic, which, which we call uh, um, uh, human, uh, I forgot the last one, but it's more to do with human dignity which is access to clean housing, clean streets, uh, ability to travel freely and all that. So these five spaces have always remained the focal areas for every nation. Every government pushes the same thing. Some do it on a, on a public basis that here's a billion dollars, go fix it. Consultants fly and fix it and go out again. Guess what? Only 200 million is actually spent, 800 is out. Or you could go out to the market and say, hey, who is here actually fixing it? Can we localize this issue? Can we bring in subject matter expertise from within the sectors and deploy it and not have that over overarching overhang of, hey, who's going to score it? Hey, who's going to actually tell me if this is right or wrong? Who's going to be actually allowing me to get a license for this? There is stuff to be done that all of us on a daily basis see that either is right or wrong. 
you don't need a consultant from Singapore to come and tell you or from the US to come and tell you that you should do it three degrees left or five degrees left, right? So that's been our ultimate thesis as an equity investor. We, we, we go with an impact 3.0 view into spaces that require immediate injection of capital. And then we take a step back fairly quickly as well. We don't draw it down for 50 years and ask for um, rent seeking on it. We, we step out and then anyone else can come in and buy a secondary market from us. Okay, so, so let me, that begs the question, right? So consultants are part who you obviously don't like. Uh, 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 let, 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 let's get to the point, right? So, so you, you made a couple of points and I, I'm gonna whip up a story. I'm just connecting the dots out here, right? So you want fast ROI returns, right? You're going into emerging markets where, you know, there's woeful corruption, especially at the, at, at the ground level, right? There is tremendous greenwashing on the front end of a number of these projects. They take the money under a green umbrella, they get deployed in manners. So how are you countering all these, these forces which work against you? Are you just walking away, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna say this, are you just walking away with a great ROI but not really caring if the front end is green wash, no, is, is, is all green, but back end return is all brown. That is a great question, and thank you for asking that as well. So, so, a consultant could so, ask so one, of the, one of the best ways to kind of gauge success is if you've built it into a structure that can be listed on one of these global uh, uh, markets out there, Hong Kong being a perfect example. So when we were doing the whole Belt and Road idea uh, with, with Chinese money at that time, um, most of the questions asked were like, how can we get involved as well from a public side? So Martin said something great when he said retail wants to get involved. Retail should not get involved by being taxed as, hey, you're flying, so you need to be paying extra because you're taking a long haul flight, blah, blah, blah. Retail should be given an opportunity to invest. And therein, therein lies the solution. If I have parked four or five large power stations, green power stations, into this one whole boat, including discos, sorry, distribution companies into it as well, including long-term uh, contractual gas suppliers or some, someone, all on commercial contracts. I'm not saying corruption even exists in Michigan. So let's yeah, yeah. not say it's just a-, a It's, it's a relative, market. right? It's relative. So yeah. as long as it's there, it's there. So as long as there's a commercially viable project that works and it has been fast forwarded because there's private sector which is pushing it through the door, and we retain equity while that Holdco gets listed in Hong Kong or in London, it's a win-win because retail gets to, in, moms and pops get to invest in that Holdco, which has a perpetuity outtake for you, right? So because this is a Holdco that you can keep parking power stations into, keep parking new green projects into, and you can list it in large markets. And, and the government has this um, sort of a snowball effect of reputation as well. If you've done three right ones, the fourth, fifth, sixth will sell like hotcakes. So that creates the right ambition or, or sort of right um, incentive for equity co to come in. You can't start by saying, hey, we need to resolve this issue and you as private guys need to step in and fix this, otherwise it's back to IFC ADP. Right? So that incentive is what's missing and more and more I'm seeing that it's opening up. So rather than pulling more, hoovering in more capital just for the same old projects, same old processes, you need to kind of tweak the process to involve quicker um, um, returns. Chill, retail investors, right? So Durrani just mentioned about how, how important it is for retail investors and creating whole coast. What's your perspective and how do we actually get more and more retail investors, A, educated, right, or aware, maybe that starts from aware, B, educated, and then sort of, I guess, rallied behind this. It's funny because I'm listening to you and I'm like, you're so far, so far away from what I deal with on a daily basis. And so that also answers your question, which is before you can go out to retail investors, at least I'm speaking as a bank right now, right? I think it's really important that as a bank, we understand it and sort of believe in it at the bare minimum, because it's very hard to evangelize and pitch something if you don't necessarily believe that it's fundamentally the right thing to do. And so before we even go down that path, and mind you, there's not a lot of appetite that we're getting so far from any of our retail investors anyway, that they really want to go down this path. So there's quite a bit of work that needs to be done. So before we go there, we're focusing really more on creating some level of excitement and understanding in the bank itself. And so we, you know, we did this project with a consultant, a good one actually, sitting next to you. And part of that was, you know, a little bit of a pivot in terms of what we're doing. And we started going into equity but a lot more in terms of investing in what I would call banking adjacent, right? Anything we do a POC or a partnership with, we can also take equity. And so 
one of the things we kind of said is we do all of the kind of basic, very mundane, compliant related stuff. We want to do the stuff that's go to market, but we're not quite there yet. What we're going to do on the investment side is we're going to make a conscious effort to also look at companies that are actually making, that we believe are making an impact to the best of our knowledge and the data that we can find. And so one of the companies, I, I, I kind of pick water wastage as an example, because I think it's a very tangible example. It's also something that even if you necessarily don't believe in climate change and anything else, it's kind of hard to argue with water wastage, right? Um, and so particularly in this region, but also in places like Africa. And so one of the companies that we're, um, we're leading around with, um, they do a couple of different things that are related directly to banking. They do something else because of the technology they have. They do mapping and digital twinning of places. They do satellite footage and proprietary AI models. And they basically map out where the water is being wasted or any specific kind of um, setup. And then based on that, they're able to then do some simulations and figure out with the right intervention, how could you reduce that and by how much. And then they send people over to actually train, because it's usually farmers and, and the likes that just need to be made aware and be given the tools in order to do this a little bit better. Um, they work very closely with the uh, royal family of the Netherlands. Uh, for those of you who know the Netherlands, we're very big on water in general. Our king, uh, since he was a student, uh, He's been a bit of an expert when it comes to water, and water waste is very close to his heart. So they have this model where they come in and do all of it for free. You just need to invite them, right? But then they make their money off the credits in the marketplace that they have. And they have a partnership with a very, 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 very large tech firm that also has a uh, very well popular AI model. That's all I'll say. That AI model has generated 32% additional water wastage, just in terms of cooling the processing power. And so that's company is looking to atone for that. And so they have this model where they go in and they do the work for free. And then what they find, they sell the credits directly back to this company who was just waiting for those credits to come in. And that way the farmer makes a bit of money and this company makes a little bit of money. All they need is an invite, which I thought was really, really interesting. It's also for me, the reason I'm telling you this is because it's the same story I tell my board. It's a very easy story to tell people that you're making a difference with something that is really important for human survival. And you're doing it with relatively easy things, right? We don't necessarily have to go very, very far and go understand supply chain management or get all of that data, but you're making a difference. And when people see that you can do that, that typically opens up a bigger conversation of what else can we do, right? And how else can we embed this within that? So I'm kind of sneaking it through. I feel like you're like kicking in the front door. I'm sneaking it in the back door very slowly and build a little bit of momentum for people to kind of be able to relate to it and then ask me or us to do more of it. Um, beyond that, for us retail investors, I think what we do see is some of our more wealthy clients um, are very much interested in it, but they're interested in it primarily learning more. What does it mean? And how can you do this to your point? How can you do this without necessarily compromising on alpha, right? Because ultimately, you know, people are in it to make money, but if you can do both, that's obviously really, yeah. a really powerful story. So, Duran, come back to you. You mentioned frontier markets. Yes. We also talked briefly about greenwashing. So, it's a two part question, right? One is why the frontier markets and why not the more sort of developed, I guess, the more polluter, big, bigger <laughs> polluters, right, in, 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 in sense. Secondly, I think it would be interesting to sort of talk a little bit about you know, your perspective on greenwashing because I was reading very interesting, uh, well, it wasn't an article, it was actually a report where they said, Greenwashing has exponentially increased over the last sort of year or two, right? Where people are just announcing so-called green initiatives, but they're not green at all. Uh, how do you not get trapped into those sorts of projects? Like, so what do you guys do differently? So, two feet. Two I'll, I'll say the second part first, because okay. um, it's easier and it's quicker. So, um, first of all, I don't want to point fingers. So, greenwashing, like you defined it, it is what it is, meaning anyone who isn't actually green, just wants to get an allocation from the big uh, pay up, uh, payers and, and he positions his business in such a way that it's like green so they get. Problem is that most allocators are incentivized just to deploy. Yes. If they don't deploy it within the first year, next year their allocation is lowered. You know this better than I do as well. It's just the basic model how uh, multilaterals have operated. And that's why Web3, uh, sorry, uh, Impact 3.0 we believe certainly in because mm -hmm. it it sidesteps that pitfall. Our money doesn't come from them, they're not LPs, so we never get driven into that uh, conversation where they say, hey, you just deploy, forget about um, what the returns are. And uh, we were, I believe you we were talking earlier about this as well, that uh, some of my other peers who are very good friends and are co-investors in our project as well. 
they would at times question why we're taking so long on such certain due diligences, whereas they've already allocated or they've already said green lighted it. Um, and the simple answer they give us is my LP is telling me to deploy, man, I need to do it within the next few weeks because then the next year cycle starts. So he is ver verbalizing what we believe to be true. Uh, whereas for us, it has to make uh, economic sense. Um, any PE worth their salt won't do more than three, two, three, four transactions a year maximum. And each and every one of them has to function and work and, and become successful exits as well. It's not VC where you spray and pray. Unfortunately, in greenwashing projects, it is still spray and pray. The LP still says, I need to deploy. You spray, if you three or five kickback out of 10, that's a good result. So let's just, so that one aside. Um, now coming back to why our markets and not developed markets where it's easier relatively, but the ROIs are lower. Um, if you take a step back to ESG's original thesis, we're trying to solve structural issues that I, structural deficits that I pointed out, right? And what makes it lucrative for us or, and a more impactful play for everyone in the ecosystem is these are markets with 250 million people in Pakistan, for example, 200, uh, almost 200 million, 190 million in Bangladesh. Average age is in Bangladesh is 27 years old. Average age in Pakistan is 23 years old. Highly digitized, highly urbanized, Data consumption is one of the highest in the world. And guess what they're needing right now? Data centers, power stations. Okay, forget that side. If you come to mainstream consumption, FMCG, um, nappies, education, healthcare, uh, fruits, jams, jellies, you know. So consumption is on the rise. Those economies have a youth bulge. They're coming through the system. They're saying, we want more. Now, therein lies the better opportunity to make an impact rather than going to aging populations and asking them to change their behavior. If you come to these growing populations, which will become the consumers of the world next 100 years, you can then define, so I'll give you an example of what one of the projects we did, which might tweak it for you. One of the lowest nutrient uh, uh, con uh, contents for um, FMCGs in the world is your biscuits and jams and jellies that are being sold for cheaper cents, right? And the transition from mainstream old school diet that we grew up with into these new packaged goods is immense. Both the parents are working just to make ends meet and they just give their kids a few packets of, I won't brand the names right now, a few packets of chips or biscuits and saying go to school, eat this and come back if they're even going to school. And that's one of the lowest content, highest calorie intakes that kids are taking. So what we invested in one of these markets, again I won't name them because there's a signature involved, is high nutrient, high calorie biscuits that are manufactured with some of the people who used to work in these FMCG companies who've come out and said, we're killing these kids. So, and that, if you market it correctly, if you spread the news to the retail correctly, picks up so easily that now we're doing three countries. We started with one, now we're in three countries. So products like that is what you can do so fast in these countries. And, and again, more is good concept has to change as well. Every one of them says, so I said initially that like high consumption markets. If you can take that high consumption model to make it to a medium consumption, but for right vital products, then you're solving it in two ends. One, that high consumeristic society changes. So your, your problem comes from the fact that people consume too much. That means too much plastic comes in the system, too much uh, crops are being destroyed for cash crops. Um, so you change that model at the base end where you're changing the demand patterns and you're driving society into more sustainable consumption. And at the back end, you're trying to solve for the waste stage, waste power plants, waste to energy, um, by investing in that side as well. So these are the markets that are more, um, that are more low hanging fruit available. That's why we chose these. Can I, can I ask a question? I'm just kind of curious. So how do you track the sustainability of that impact? So how do you, I plant a tree and you know, how do you know that next week I don't actually cut that tree down? I love this question. So it's amazing. Um, we practiced this. No, 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 we didn't. <laughs> no, no, I'm glad you asked. They did. We had, a, we had a question about this as well. So um, one of our pet peeves was initially when IFC and us we came to a loggerheads over a certain project where they said, we can't co-invest with you unless there's a tracking module or yeah. exactly what you're asking. That how do we know this is right or this is wrong? And then they, we noticed that there was a trend to it because they did the same to one of our co-investors in another project and we decided not to engage them and we just went on ahead. 
Six months fast forward, they said, hey, uh, IFC is launching the global impact signatories platform where every one of us has to sign up to become accredited to be able to do impact investing. And we weren't the only one. We were supposed to be the only one from Asia at that time. We weren't the only one, but a bunch of our friends in Europe and US also stood up and said, who made you the hall monitor? Like, why do you, IFC, get to say whether I'm accredited or not? And there was a big hoo-ha. This was at the sidelines of the UNGA in New York. And one of my partners, Jason Bajaj, he runs the policy on this one. He's ex-IFC as well, ex-Gurman as well. So he stood up and he took a big uh, stance on this. That's what Web, uh, sorry, uh, Impact 3.0 was going. To the extent where IFC turned back and came and said, no, 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 it's a peer-to-peer -peer analysis. We're all signatories. We all disclose end of the year what we've done. So it's a peer-to-peer. -peer. If we've made a few investments this year, we'll do a disclosure annual. It'll be shared amongst all of us. And we get to see who the best performers, what the worst performers are subjectively. What did you invest in? What impact did it made in your mind or from your eyes and how we see it? And where are we going with the project so far as well? Versus who the worst were who were claiming they were doing something and that might form another greenwashing aspect as well. So it has to be a peer-to-peer -peer analysis. You can't create a whole monitor because the moment you do, an invested interest finds a way to position themselves behind that scoring system as well, we're screwed again. Great. I have no idea how much time I have, but I'll, I'll keep rolling with another question here. So Gio coming to you, right? I, uh, I can't ever meet Gio and not talk about Web3 in some form or the other. Right, so, so we're, <laughs> I'm not gonna force you to the Web3 conversation <laughs> here. Right, but, but you know, coming back to the topic of, of, of trackability, traceability, et cetera, et cetera, right? Number of emerging technologies, including AI and stuff, is now starting to sort of get, you know, their foothold. foothold. How do you see that play in, in terms of solving the bigger problem? Um, all right, let's break it down into Web2 and Web3, right? So the Web2 side, which is AI for me, because AI has been around for decades, yep. right? And so if I look at AI, I think what it does is the same thing it has been doing actually for a very, very long time. It's just that I think the difference now is you have Gen AI, you have, more, you have uh, language models that are far more advanced. Uh, structuring data, identifying data sources, getting that data at a format that's easily digestible and then using that to kind of do predictive analytics. For me, that's still what I would use AI for. And that's very internal mm -hmm. operational efficiency type stuff but also to be able to analyze large and unstructured sets of data, which I think is important because right now for us, if I look at some of the things we need to do, the amount of things we need to be able to track and then interpret and then you know categorize is massive. And so AI solves part of that problem for us. I think the second thing, which is the Web3 thing, is obviously if you look at blockchain being, and most chains anyway, not all, but most of them being immutable of sorts, right? And a public ledger, I think, and okay, we're gonna go down a rabbit hole here, but you know, other than Bitcoin, really, there's very few chains that are truly immutable, mm -hmm. um, ultimately, because all of the data, no, we're not gonna go down that path. I'm just gonna keep it here. Having something stored on the blockchain, I think that's probably a very interesting way of leveraging that technology together with AI. So you have the data, you, you, you issue certain things, whether it's tokens or whether it's credits or anything else, and then you can store that on chain, so it's publicly available for everyone to see. I think it's a means to an end. I don't think it's the end by itself. And on top of that, there's a lot of debate around how much of a negative impact both AI and Web3 capabilities will have on the environment, right? And so that's what I see. We were at a think thing the other day with a bunch of people in Web3 thinking about how can we really store it. And honestly, we didn't really come much further than just that. As it's a ledger, it's immutable. You can store things on it. We haven't really figured out anything else you can do. There's one example of a Web3 organization that I will say who's doing really interesting work in the stuff. It's a company called Gitcoin um, out of the US. Mm. They are an investor. Uh, they have a really interesting model with quadru quadru quadratic funding, sorry, which is kind of the idea where if you're RTD Little, or a bank maybe better, right? I want to invest $100,000 or a million dollars or something. They invest in public goods, right? And that could be water wastage or anything else, but also infrastructure products. I give that million to them, but I don't get to pick what it's invested on. Instead, what they do is they have this massive community and then you want to vote on what gets funded. You have to actually put a token, which has a monetary value. And the idea is where you put your money, where the majority of people actually put their money, that's what gets funded. And then the big corporation, so they're working with Andrews and Horowitz right now, they found it really frustrating, but you don't get to pick, right? You just say, I want to fund a public good in this space, and that's happening. It's one of the few Web3 companies because they leverage Web3 capabilities to make the governing process a lot more democratic. 
um, and a lot more impact focus. Beyond that, I haven't seen uh, any Just more. a few examples for us as well. We, we've invested in one project where it's simple tra traceability, so for medical yeah. goods. So in the markets that we discussed, like you said, there's a lot of uh, corruption where fake drugs are going doing the rounds as well. And with a simple QR code mechanism, you see if the drug is real or not. So simple as that. So that, that company that just does that in South Asia and now it's going to Africa as well. It's going well. It signed up with some of the biggest companies in the world right now. So it doesn't have to be too complicated. No, no, as just a traceable sort of a new platform, oh, Web 3.0 has really helped. So, education, right? so last question, I know Oscar wants me off the stage here, but I, I've got a question very simply, right? So the so point which Durani you made was people need to make money and you also said people have to get their ROI, right? So as the low hanging fruit vanishes, right? And that whole maturity mm -hmm. stuff happens and your return on investments start to disappear, right? What happens? We don't make return on investments, we die because no one wants to touch climate financing? Yes. So, so, no, yeah. but, but that's yes. a question yes. I'm gonna ask, right? So, so if the entire driver is purely material, you will soon get to a stage where every market will become mature. So can I start by just, I'll just add a little bit sentence and then I'll move, move away because you're right from a completely equity hat on perspective, you're right. That's exactly the way it would play out. But from my, some of my closer friends, my small friends are here in the room as well. They know one of my really close friends who's always been driving this down my throat for the last five years. He's like, Durani, the whole uh, um, measurement perspective is wrong. He's like, GDP growth should not be the merit. But that's the line we're in, unfortunately. So more is more consumption is good or more is good it has to change. So it's not about the low hanging fruit and the return metrics that should be the driver here. Unfortunately, that's the band-aid on a gashing wound. The actual answer lies, like I mentioned before, in the early stage of behavioral change in how societies function. Con high consumerism is going to take us to our grave. We have to start realigning um, how some of the Bhutans of the world or Norways of the world function today as well, where or Japan of the world, where kids are driven to understand, to reuse, recycle, whatever the fourth phase is. My kids even learned that in Hong Kong, um, where, where wastage is not a part and parcel of daily life. Buying a quick bottle of five dollar water is not ans the answer. You're habitually trained to carry your water bottle with that needs to be filled out with publicly available drinkable water tanks everywhere. It's just small examples like that that change behavioral patterns that down the line will feed us more. So that's the solution. Not me, not the banks, not the equities of the world. Close the talk. Not the banks, you heard it. So, <laughs> no, I don't have anything positive to say. Honestly, I wish I had. I don't know what the answer is, but you know, there's a lot of things that are bad for you. Sugar's bad, smoking is. Most, for most people, bad drugs are considered bad. Uh, you know, overabundance of alcohol, many other things are bad, and yet many people do them still, right? And you see how hard it's been to change these kind of things that immediately impact you. And most people will have a case in their fa immediate family of someone who has suffered of any of these kind of things, and yet it's been incredibly hard. Now you want people to zoom out and kind of look at a generational level, what may or may not be bad for the planet. That they may or may not actually experience themselves. I have very, very young kids, they're two twins. And so I, I am increasingly now more concerned. I, I mean, I'm gonna be honest, I wasn't before. Really, I wasn't. I, I kind of wish I could say I was, but I wasn't. But now that I have kids, I feel like, okay, so now I need to think about what, what, what world am I leaving them, right? And so and what world are they gonna leave for their kids? So this is a long way of saying, I'm not necessarily very optimistic. It doesn't necessarily mean that things will not get better, but I think you kind of your your statement was kind of like it wasn't really a question, but it was a statement. It's going to be really, really, really hard because the moment the financial incentive goes, my sense is most people's direct intrinsic motivation will not be enough to kind of make up for that. Especially not if it continues to cost as much to do what's right. Just like it costs a lot to eat right, right? Fundamentally, if you think about it, you want to eat healthy. That's far more expensive than it is to eat, you know, the package of crisps that people want to give. There's a reason why people do that. It's not because they want to feed their kids the wrong things is because they cannot afford typically proper healthy food and there's a lack of education maybe. So I don't see that problem as any different from what you're just asking. Thanks, Jill. Okay. Right, sorry. Bro. I'll just add one last sentence. Um, you speak Hindi, I'm guessing, as well. So in Urdu, we have a saying of difference between talim and tarbiyat. Talim means education. Tarbiyat means upbringing. The tarbiyat part is missing in our society. That needs to come back. 
and that will fix the lockdown issues. Can I ask, before we go, I'm just curious, so you're a consultant, so what's your perspective on this? <laughs> yes, <laughs> let's get it back. <laughs> Let me give you the answer. We yeah. actually just wrote a report on it. You can read it. <laughs> uh, that's Gio, a good consulting Gio, Gio, thanks. Durrani, thanks. Thank you for staying here. Thank you, everybody.